Hi everyone. So good to be here. Today we're going to talk about uh, social impact, how to do good through art, technology and fashion. And I'm super excited for the team that I have here on the stage. Super rock stars. We're going to talk about them just in a minute. You know, the Web3 has a potential to change the way we do good in the world. It's just amazing how many opportunities it brings with it. You know, leveraging the blockchain, the decentralized platforms, the transparency that it enables, and so many other things can really make impact in people's lives. By creating WIN, which is a nonprofit that supports women in need through the blockchain, I am able to give women financial support in places they cannot get any financial support in any other way, which is mind blowing. And there are so many stories like that that we're going to hear today from those rock stars right here on stage with me. Four people that I love and admire myself. We got Sabat, and Sabat is an Iranian-American artist and a designer. His work shines with vibrant optimism, love and beauty in the face of it all. Also, his Tokyo Punks is one of the most amazing projects that I've seen lately, and we're gonna hear about, hear about it in just a minute a little bit more. So round of applause to Sabat, first of all. We've got Elise Swaps. She's uh, always not saying right her, her name, but it's always the perfect. This is the best you've ever said it by right? far. Yeah, right? she killed it. <laughs> but she's an amazing, amazing creator. She's a leader in the uh, NFT and crypto space. And it was said by the Rolling Stones and the NFT Now 100 and also at the Afrotech. And through her top selling artwork and tearless support to other creators, and through the Sunrise Art Club, which is going to talk about in just a little bit. She works a lot with women and women in color in Web3. And she's amazing in general. If you haven't checked her Instagram and all the social media platforms, go right now and check them as we speak. Give a round of applause to Elise. And we got Michelle. Michelle Reeves. She's an international entrepreneur who has built multiple businesses across Web2 and Web3. She named on the 2022 power list by Maria Claire USA. She's the queen of crypto by Forbes, and she's the CEO of Mavion and the co-founder, which is a global fashion and NFT platform that connects physical assets with digital collectibles. Round of applause to Michelle. And we got Nick on stage. Nick, Nick is like a, a, a golden mine that I, I have found just recently. He's one of my favorite in this planet, and he is technology entrepreneur and the founder of uh, Nifty Dreams DAO, which is an amazing DAO that supports artists from all over the world. Nick has been doing an amazing work with artists for a long time now. He's been supporting more than 3,000 artists in the industry. He's also an entrepreneur who has two exits for startups that he was involved in, and he's a superstar. Period. I mean, he's, he's a developer, he developed Win, and it's just so many things I can say about him. Round of applause to Nick. So let's just dive straight in the conversation, you know? How do blockchain and decentralized networks facilitate freedom of expression in fashion, Michelle? Let's start with you. <laughs> Okay, great question. Um, for the first time ever, the best ideas can win, not the biggest marketing budgets. We can lower the playing field um, and the barriers to entry so that everyone has a chance to be discoverable. And I think about the global talent. One of my first businesses was an e-commerce business to work with the 40 million independent designers around the world. And what stood out to me, we actually did this calculation at Techstars in their program that for a new independent designer in fashion to find a new uh, consumer uh, using Etsy, which years ago was the only way to find and build your business, it, there was a 0.000004% chance that you could find a new consumer. I mean, it's mathematically impossible. Let's just call it what it is. Um, blockchain is changing that, the ability to connect to like-minded communities and for the big brands to discover you, collaborate with you and to grow without having to have the startup capital, the infrastructure to actually manufacture everything you need in fashion, uh, that is a game changer. 
How do you see the the big brands coming into the space? I mean, now that you're working with multiple the, of them. The big brands are hungry for consumer acquisition always. And when you've got these startup, brilliant creative minds creating extraordinary designs and growing their own communities, big brands are hungry for that. They are looking at, yes, Gen Z, but now at Gen Alpha. And they are trying to get in with them as early as they can. I have a 10-year-old son. Balenciaga does not care about me anymore. All of those ads, all of their comms are targeted at him. And when we go shopping, if he sees that store, I'm constantly shocked that he even knows how to pronounce that brand. Because I didn't know how to say it until I was like 35. Um, so big brands are hungry for the things that our emerging designers can build and offer. And I, if I could even add, because yes, I'm please. so, the last time I was on a panel with Michelle, we were at New York Fashion Week. Um, and you just said so many amazing things, but I'd even add to like opposite because I'm not a designer myself. I think it's so amazing and interesting how as consumers, how involved we can be now in the fashion experiences. I was invited recently to an online fashion show by uh, Vivian Tam and Swansit was uh, assisting with that production. And when you went inside the actual experience, you know, you can try on the clothes in the VR, in an AR, you're you're also sitting in your chair, you see your your name on your seat. It's like this wonderful experience where you can be anywhere in the entire world and still feel involved with what's happening. And I think that's just so exciting. I have a question for you about that because this was a really great example of the future of New York Fashion Week. If you think back to Fashion Week, historically it's filled with A-list celebrities. Did you find that there was a much more democratized audience with you in that experience? Absolutely. I think it also allows us to be more inclusive and intentional on that space where we can invite people who aren't normally invited. Sure, there can be the A-listers or whatever, but we can still have an amazing balance of making sure we invite students or people of color or people from other countries, just making sure we're just doing the right thing at the right moment. I love it. I love it. Nick, why do you think that collective like Nifty Dreams is necessary these days? How, how does it impact the world? It's a great question. Uh, I'll break it down into, into three parts. The, the first uh, part is that I think we are under uh, a sort of ecosystem delusion if we think that the current model of marketplaces, uh, individual collectors for artists is sustainable and scalable. It, it's not. Uh, there's just a glut of uh, artworks and uh, artists and there's just not enough capital coming in from collectors. That's the first problem. The second problem is that while individual artists might have found a developer or two to collaborate with, at scale, in order to move this technology forward and this ecosystem forward, we need artists to be able to collaborate with developers and create innovative new things in the NFT space. That needs to happen. And I think the third and most important thing is that if we are going to really, really grow the NFT art ecosystem, we have to make headway into the retail space. And retail brands are not going to negotiate with individual uh, artists, right? You need to have a collective. That's why PFP uh, projects were successful in, in connecting with brands. So we need a collective of artists who can negotiate together and make it possible for brands to get access to one of one art. So uh, I think I can sum it up best by saying this. It's an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go solo. But if you want to go far, go together. I love it. So true for every initiative and everything that is in life. So Beth, you're doing the Tokyo Punks. I want to hear more about that. This is an amazing initiative that you have created. You're working with a lot of galleries and a lot of artists for so many years. Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, Tokyo Punks is basically a iteration of a childhood dream. So ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be the next Hello Kitty. Actually, there's a book that I'm going to write someday. It's called Hello Kitty Complex because I was probably the only 12-year-old boy that would hang out in Hello Kitty stores wide-eyed looking at things and I believed that was success. It took me 30 years of branding expertise and all of that stuff that I knew to help clients like Thayer's and Witch Hazel brands and all of this stuff do really well and I still had that same mentality built in where if you put cute stuff on other stuff it'll do well. Well that was the wrong thing. Uh, in 2010, I just realized that if I painted this stuff every day, I was, uh, um, I was just a frustrated artist and I needed an audience. So it's taken about 10 years to, to come to what Tokyo Punks is today, which is a brand of 
characters living in the metaverse and there's a beautiful community that owns them and is building around them. I'm a huge fan of Sabat. That's probably most of the people you here are. Um, you're doing an amazing work also with artists in so many levels. How do you think we can bring or incorporate more and more artists and people to do social goods through the blockchain? Doing social good for uh, ha as an artist, I think us artists have always done it, right? Uh, it's usually been, we've been tricked into doing it by being told that if we give away our artwork, we're going to get a lot of uh, rich people looking at our work. And it's true. I, I've sat at these expensive dinners where my artwork has been sold for twenty, thirty thousand dollars in front of me while I had $800 in my own bank account. <laughs> and it was great because, you know, I was going for a good cause. I mean, I've paid for cleft lip surgeries. I've paid for uh, hearing aids. I've, you know, being called and saying that children have are able to hear because of your paintings. That was the way I could give uh, without having to be personally connected to that child. And because I would probably suffer a, a lot if I knew what was going on. Uh, I believe now it's about scalability, right? To be able to put out a project and donate half of it. For example, let's say you do a 10K project and it brings in $1.6 million in 20 minutes and you're able to give away half of that. It's amazing. I mean, and an individual can do that. It doesn't have to be a million artists. So I think we're in a beautiful space where uh, not only we can earn as artists, we can give a lot of us our, ourselves away. I think giving the best parts of ourselves away is probably the best thing you can do as artists. Amazing. A question for everyone here. What do you think are the challenges or the barriers in doing social good or social impact when it comes to the blockchain and the Web3? Um, there's so many things going on and rumors and why don't you tell me what do you guys think about it? I mean, I think one of the hardest things I've come into is onboarding other nonprofits and making sure that we can support everything that's happening outside of Web3. Um, I've just been doing a lot of onboarding, a lot of education, and a lot of people are scared. So making it make sense to them, I think, is like the biggest key for me. Um, but other than that, obviously, like when it comes to social stuff, people always want like or at least with NFTs, um, and the issue with social is that, you know, people want utility with things or they want, you know, some exchange of some sort. But, you know, when it comes to nonprofit or social work, it's just that feel good feeling. Well, I mean, now I'm really figuring out how do we reward and gamify being a good person? And that means almost tokenizing, you know, when you do something well, maybe you support someone who's incarcerated or you help someone with a cleft lip you get a token. And then when you collect a certain amount of tokens, you can exchange that for, you know, a certain prize or an NFT or something physical that's really amazing and, and, you know, supportive for yourself and for others. So I think that that's kind of like what I'm most excited about, but also where we really got to do some work. I would echo that. I think the idea is um, people, it, it's less about that like one-time campaign because people, yes, it can feel good, but I think in this space, people are so early tuned into this idea of utility what's in it for me what's the long-term uh cycle or model and i think what we need to help social impact causes and organizations think about is you actually can be an inherent part of business models now and that's actually one of the challenges we overcame with mavion so mavion is our pfp that we launched and we did something pretty simple um in every nft it features a a, a fashion accessory so maybe you have a necklace, maybe you have a bag, you have a, a ring in yours. And what's really cool is the holder gets the physical piece. So this is actually you know, one of the rings in there. I have this NFT, I get to wear this ring. Now this designer, small independent, they make like 50 of these rings. What social good could we possibly do for this independent designer out of Mexico City? Well, you know, we could do, we could turn this ring into a digital asset. And now this ring you can buy in Roblox to Central Land, where it uh, buy it for your avatar for Ready Player Me. And with every sale of that scalable, infinite number of digital rings, they can receive royalties. And now we can put them into an ongoing model of the business and not just a one-time campaign. And I think social organizations and brands need to come together to align on how they can truly integrate. I, I think one of the big challenges is that uh, the, the ecosystem we have created is uh, 
not accessible to everybody. I'm speaking especially about people who are less privileged, who don't have access to a as much technology or 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 wealth in in general. So I, I think we need to uh, do more in that er area. Uh, more specifically, I feel like if we were to pursue a pathway which is more hybrid between sort of the web web two and web three, we could uh, get more folks uh, on board. Uh, I just want to talk about uh, indigenous uh, peoples first, because I think uh, as as time progresses, a lot of cultures, et cetera, are being lost. Uh, I myself went to the Amazon rainforest to remote villages in, in Paraguay and Argentina and met with tribes. And we created an experiment where we used NFTs in order to help fund those communities and give them a sustainable lifestyle. So that's possible, but it requires us to kind of have this thinking where we bridge between Web 2 and Web 3 and not just say that, all right, it's all about tokens and it's all about crypto, et cetera. It's got to be a middle ground. I totally agree. So, bad it goes to you. Uh, I think from a... I promised my wife I wouldn't say, uh, <laughs> on stage. She said, did you practice? I said... It's what? I don't hear I, I, She asked me if I was going to go, um, on stage, <laughs> and I just caught myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there you go again. See, I did it. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge is, uh, trust and traceability and making sure where this money is going. Whenever I promise that I'm going to donate something or donate a quite a amount of ETH that I've earned from something for like Ukraine or Turkey or Iran, there's always this thing of like, one, where do I send it? Which Ukraine place is going to take ETH that's like legit, right? That's always been really difficult. Two, then proving back to everybody. That's pretty easy to do, to show like on transactions where it's gone. But it still needs some sort of user interface where normal people can see where that money is going and where it's coming from and who who's getting it. And then at the end seeing that wallet and seeing where that money is going to go to. So if I send it to, I think I sent it, like when I sent, I think we promised like three or four ETH to Ukraine. I had, I mean, I was scared. I sent it to the Ukraine government ETH address, but I don't know where it went, you know, for real. Like if you really ask me, it could have been just some dude that started an organization. Right. I mean, there's, there's yeah. rugs everywhere. So that yeah. could be another example of yeah. the authenticity itself. Yeah. You have no idea. So I think that's a challenge. But other than that, I think it's, it's good. I still think that the Web3 enables us to track everything because it's so transparent. And I think that's the benefit of having a Web3 um, organization that is a nonprofit organization or any charity work that has been done on the blockchain. Everything is traceable and everything is transfer it everything is to the face you cannot really take a cut or or sell it to someone that you don't know who who he is so i'm very excited for you know web3 and 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 the decentralized uh platforms that enable to create this transformation when the the reality today you don't know when you're paying a, a nonprofit or uh, a charity work you don't know where it goes it might go to the ceo or it might someone some can take some chunks and you'll never know I actually have a question for you on this. I mean, I think you're solving a big problem with all the women that you work with through WIN. I'm assuming one of the challenges is their own individual access. You know, what you're doing is aggregating and helping to provide the tools for them because they're not able to independently. Is that right? Yes. What we do on uh, WinWeb3, we are creating tools for them to, first of all, as of today, literally we are open for 10 months only, right? So we're just in the building process. And what happens is those ladies are sending it to me and I'm uploading it for them on the blockchain. That's what happened at this moment. But we are building now an educational center in the website to be able to share with them all the information and to be able for them to do it themselves. We also have a future goal to actually build like a, a technology hubs or places where it can actually go and upload their own content. Imagine a woman sitting in Rwanda and she has no other way to sell her craft, no other way to create money. And now suddenly there is a way to do it on the blockchain. So she's not only been able to make her own money, but she's also been empowered because she feels she's working now. She feels she's able to finance herself, to create something that can bring her money back, not just 
to have fun by creating art and and bring it to someone else. So it's it's all together mentally, uh, uh, um, uh, financially, and, and support, and it's all through the blockchain, which is for me a mind blowing. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm the one who was also leading the I'm the moderator. Yes, Sabat, you wanted to add something. When when you put it that way, sometimes I think of like two years ago. Right before I sold my first NFT, I was packing and shipping prints. And, you know, it was a really, I was a shipping manager for this artist named Sabit, you know, basically. Uh, but it just, it still blows my mind that uh, it took this long for us to do this. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I hear you. Yeah. I yeah. hear you. I wish that happened 10 years ago already. Yeah. This is, this is. And I wish everyone in the planet will already understand the power of the Web3 and what advantages and amazing thing it can bring to the table. By the way, you know, when we're talking about WinWeb3, we, one of my main goals is to create a sustainable, healthy ecosystem. So my dream is to be able to have artists donating art and they will get a piece of the pie. So whenever an art is being sold, an artist will get a percentage of the money and also the women will get the charity and every, there's a win-win situation for everyone and this way you can grow all together because people will want to sell more they will want to bring more art and will want to put their art on on the marketplace and more women will get charities more women will get empowered and it's all around the market the blockchain and the and the web3 which is amazing okay back to the questions i guess <laughs> i'm just being carried away um, I want to hear what you guys are doing these days and how I know that each and every one of you is doing a lot of things to impact society and to create changes through the blockchain. I want to hear from each and every one of you. What what are you doing or have done to actually impact the world? Maybe, Nick, you, you, you start and we'll go from there. I'll highlight uh, two, two things. So uh, as probably we all know, the Islamic Republic blocks pretty much everybody from Internet access. And that has hurt the ability for uh, uh, Iranian artists to earn a livelihood. So basically I went uh, and found uh, some resources on the ground in Iran and we set up uh, servers and we set up servers in Germany to create a tunneling protocol. So 2000 artists now are able to freely access the, the uh, internet and do whatever they have to regardless of what the Islamic Republic does. So it does yes. mean I can't go into Iran, I will probably be shot, but it, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, and uh, the second thing is we are experimenting. The whole uh, Nifty Dreams DAO is uh, modeled after sort of a Silicon Valley incubator. Uh, we are experimenting at scale on different and new ways to monetize NFT art because the collector and artist model is, is not going to be sustainable long term, as I said earlier. So what we are doing is we are piloting a project right now with a company in Portugal called Diverge Sneakers, where they may allow you to go online and create a custom sneaker from scratch. And what we are doing is essentially uh, having the artists in, in the DAO uh, consign their artwork to the DAO and the DAO then uh, makes it available to Divert Sneakers. At the end of the checkout process, uh, a customer can choose an independent artwork, uh, artist artwork, apply to the shoe, and two weeks later, you've got a custom sneaker at your doorstep. So we want to do that at scale and we want to make it possible for every retail product that has a surface to have one of one art. So whether it's your curtains, your pillows, your umbrellas, uh, I don't see any reason why you can't, when you buy a car at the dealership, choose artwork and have it come pre-wrapped so it's not boring white or black or gray. You know, So my, my vision and the DAO's vision is that we will have you completely surrounded by art because uh, in a way, it's a counter to social media, which has acted as a polarizing force. I feel like art can result in a kinder, gentler world. And the more we expose consumers to art on an everyday basis, the better our world can become. Woo! Uh, yes, a plus for the that. Yes, yes, word. Yeah. As, as an Iranian American artist, I'd like to thank you for what you did. It's something that I don't think any of us would have the mental capacity or the prowess to do. So I thank you for that. I too am probably going to get shot if I go to Iran, uh, but because I draw boobs and I post them on Instagram, so it's a different reason. Uh, but thank you. I just wanted to thank you for that. So, Beth, if you're the mic, you have it. So you can share with us your your part. Of, what uh, yeah, what type of social good have uh, happened in your area? 
Well, I mean, as soon as I came into the space, the first thing I had was to call all my friends and say, you guys got to jump on. They thought I was crazy because the way I was talking was not like this. I heard you on Clubhouse at the beginning. It was more like, yes. hey, have you heard of NFTs? You got to get on now. You got to get on now, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so that was the first of it was bringing people on. But how that scaled was I started to showcase more more and more artists in a art uh, project and an art show called Stratosphere. So Stratosphere is the largest NFT art showcase in the world. Uh, I hold it annually both in real life and online using Spatial. Uh, in 2021, we showcased uh, 600 artists. There's no gatekeeping. Uh, it's open to all. There's no charges. There's no fees. And nobody makes money. If the artist makes a connection and a sale, it's theirs. You know, Stratosphere is just there to facilitate. Uh, and, tw and we rented, I think, 500 screens in a 5,000 square meter gallery in China, Beijing. We did it again last year in 2022. In NFT NYC, we had a partnership with Samsung, showcased 800 artists, and the goal this year is to break 1,000 artists. And Woo! yeah, thank you. I, I think uh, amazing. One of my issues with it was if I show more artists, is it going to impact them? Is it going to, you know, because you're now watering it down, and you know, there's so many artists being shown. Uh, but the stories I've heard of each and individual artist that has seen their artwork on a 50 foot screen that we showcased every year, we had a pretty big screen, uh, just them seeing themselves, a reflection of themselves somewhere else has been, um, life changing for them. So we'll continue to do it as long as I have, and I have the partners to do it. So look out for stratosphere 2023 at NFT NYC, if not Basel. Amazing. Round of applause to Sabet. Yes. Uh, I think about social good and doing good for everyone here in the audience. You know, we all have bills to pay. We're all working, studying, learning. And I think about, we have all lined the pockets of private equity, the jackets you're wearing, the bags you have, hundreds, thousands of dollars. Did you get anything for that? Private equity did. I want to create true co-ownership through our NFTs. So everything from the lipstick you are wearing to the hat on your head is benefiting you, the very person who is building that brand and the brand who's making it. So I'm a founder of Sunrise Art Club, which is a creative impact agency, and we create curriculums and events dedicated to inclusion, inviting individuals to, to help Web3 make sense and to reverse engineer projects, not because you're trying to chase to be involved in someone else's community, but how can you utilize this tool for yourself? And then we also created the first NFT marketplace for incarcerated artists. So we're really trying to create a whole new <laughs> work for individuals. So thank you so much. Yes. I want to wrap up and say, people, everyone can do good. Everyone can be the change they want to see in the world. Look at these four people, they're changing the world. Give them a big round of applause. Woo! Woo! Yes! Thank you, everyone!